Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever in the world you are today. Um, so today is Valentine's Day, February 14th. Happy uh, Valentine's Day, Nevin. Um, and, and really to all of you out there as well. Uh, today is, a, is an interesting day. We, we've been watching the SEC is, is on a rampage lately. Uh, any dart that they can throw on the wall that they think that there is a vulnerable company that they can attack. Uh, it seems, seems like they're having a lot of fun over there right now. I wouldn't describe it as fun, but that certainly seems like they're just really going kind of as, as far and wide as they possibly we can. Um, however, Bitcoin is, is back up at 22,000. Um, we're seeing, you know, a, a real big revival in the cryptocurrency markets. We're seeing so much innovation, so much building right now in the space, because when we're in, um, you know, bear market and, and still not a winter, I think it's it's had hints of a winter. Um, but but clearly, we're in a bear, we'd, we'd all like to see that bull again. But but it's going to take a little bit of regulatory compliance, I believe, to, to get to that next bull. Um, there's some rules of the game that I think that a few people were uncomfortable with. And when I say few people, I mean government agencies. Um, and they don't like <laughs> losing control of, of their monopoly um, on, on financial uh, markets and financial institutions. So um, with that, I have the most amazing guest we can possibly have today. I have uh, Mr. Navin Gupta uh, from Mina Ripple. And uh, I think most people have heard of this company, understand uh, this company, but I wanna take a second, Navin, and really go back to understand kind of where you came from prior to, uh, to launching uh, Ripple. Yeah, sure, Jay. First of all, great to uh, for you to invite me. Thank you very much. And happy Valentine's Day to everybody, to you, to your listeners, and of course, everybody who's on the Zoom call. Um, so just like, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of simplify. Um, so like all good Indians grew up in India and then went for, to the U.S. MBA school on a scholarship. I went to a school called as Thunderbird, uh, where I started business. And right out of school, I joined Citigroup on campus. Um, um, Another story missed uh, September 11 by 10 minutes. Uh, had I was in the path train 10 minutes before actually the plane hit, oh uh, walking to my office on 111 wall, um, but c'est la vie, right? So that time you realize the value of life. Um, coming back, um, worked with Citigroup for a number of years, mostly in the transaction banking and the payments business, and uh, mostly in San Francisco, covering all the tech names on the West Coast. So Amazon, Google, Intel, Qualcomm. You Nokia, you name it, all these guys were my clients. And I'll draw some reference to them when we think about the blockchain world in terms of where were they in their journey in 2001, 2002, and how do I see some of the parallels in the blockchain space later on. And then uh, did a switch, uh, moved from San Francisco to Hong Kong, moved from Citigroup to HSBC, uh, and moved from sort of coverage uh, into product management. So did that for 10 years at HSBC in multiple markets around the world. Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, Taipei, India, and in India particularly so, uh, because at that time I was also on the board of a company called as National Payment Corporation of India, which created the UPI or the, or, or the payment system. But more than payment system, they created the universal ID. So today in India, even 10 years ago, you could just use my email or my phone number to essentially send my money. You don't need to know my name, Naveen Gupta. You don't need to know my account number. And that made it very simple. And some of those, things need to get transported into the blockchain space because it's a way too complicated. But again, just coming back, um, got bored of banking, said, hey, you know what? I want to become an entrepreneur. So started building Uber for trucks in India, my own company. And I thought, hey, Uber for cars works. So Uber for trucks need to work as well. Uh, exited that in 2017. Uh, and I was thinking what to do. And there were two things very clear in my mind. Uh, so one, that blockchain say stream A and AI machine learning stream B are going to change uh, the financial world as we know today. So decided to go for stream A, um, spoke with um, Ripple, spoke with the uh, consensus at Joe Lubin and, um, and, and also spoke with R3. Uh, decided to go with Ripple because that was the payment space uh, where my expertise was directly very relevant and Ripple was the closest product to market to, to have that in uh, hands of the customers immediately. So joined Ripple about six years ago uh, in Mumbai, in India, um, worked there, ran South Asia for three years, and now run South Asia and Ripple for the last, sorry, South Asia and Mina for the last three. So about six years at Ripple. That's, a, and, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think I would also say, why should people care about payments? Um, most of the people don't realize that, but actually very large part of what banks uh, do for people is actually payments, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at the case that Citigroup made 
to the Fed for the bailout to happen in 2008, it was primarily around payments to say, hey, we provide transaction banking services to, of course, um, uh, thousands of corporations and a lot of time US corporations, and they would be in a jeopardy in terms of just say, for example, PNG doing payments and collections for their business all around the world, and hence we should be bailed out. So very large part of money or large part of client relationship at a bank is just pure payments. It's moving money for, for example, J Inc. Uh, to yeah. Naveen Inc. from point A to point B. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, and one thing I really want to start with is you have your 10,000 hours in, in a very highly regulatory environment and compliant, compliant industry that, that requires, you know, so much audits, so much risk mitigation. And I think that's the, the point that most people don't understand. Ba banks um, are, yes, they, they move money, but the number one product that they are is risk mitigators. Um, no one is gonna bank with, with uh, you know, an institution that, that you know, is going out of business every five minutes um, and needs to be bailed out constantly because they, they're not good at managing risk. And so, you know, you spent so much time and had really great exposure to a number of these large institutions to understand how they're managing risk and, what I what I assume happened is that you just understood how they got left behind with the technology that's available. Most of these banks and institutions are running on, uh, and some of them are running on, you know, uh, ERPs and a variety of other banking systems that were designed in the '80s. Um, you know, people don't realize how much of the Swiss system still relies on dial-up modems. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent, right. And I think what people don't realize is in a payment, there are two parts. And I'm, I'm just kind of making it simple for everybody to understand, right? So one part is messaging. So almost think of it as WhatsApp. Um, say, let's assume Jay wants to send money to Naveen, and there are two institutions in the middle, let's say Bank A and Bank B. The first thing the Bank A says, hey, you know what, Jay wants to send money to Bank B at, I mean, where Naveen is an account holder, and they just communicate with each other. They make sure that everything is proper, AML, transaction, you have money in the account for the debit to happen and everything else. So this is just two banks or two institutions. It could be a, a moneygram, it could be a remitly or a transfer wise corresponding with other institution, which is the receiver of this money, right? So that's the messaging layer. And that's where SWIFT plays a part and now APIs play, play a part. And some innovation has happened there. Innovation in terms of the front end that you essentially use, like for example, cool apps and other things. And for that matter, even, um, even some of uh, the low value payment systems that have been built around the world, right? Where innovation hasn't happened, particularly around cross-border payments is around settlement, right? Which means how do we transfer money from ledger A to ledger B? Because then that's when the actual money moves and then essentially um, uh, the account gets funded or gets debited or credit, right? So if you think of Fed in the United States or any central bank, it's nothing but a big ledger, which essentially is saying, hey, you know what? I, Jay holds a credit of 100 US dollars against me. And when he wants to transfer money to Naveen and let's assume it's $20, I'll mark it down by 20 and, and essentially put plus 20 in front of Naveen's ledger, right? So all it is, is just one single ledger. And that's what where blockchain makes a big difference because it's the settlement layer that can now come together with the messaging layer, right? So now you almost have this alternate system where both of these things can together come together where you can draw the parallel rails and hence cryptocurrency still and will continue to be in my viewpoint one of the largest use cases on blockchain though blockchain is being let's say uh, experimented for multiple other things because of this settlement layer ability to move value from one ledger to another and without of course a large centralized counterparty like fed in the case of centralized system i mean you could build semi decentralized or fully decentralized system essentially using the same um, ledger that a essentially works. And, and, and Naveen, I'd love for you to explain a little bit further on this, because as long as we're geeking out on, on transaction settlements and all the other stuff, which I, I never get to do, mm. um, help me with this concept, and I, I believe I understand it, but when you get into the auditing side of things, uh, you got Bank A, which is yours, and Bank B, which is mine, and, and while we think that they're actually sending money, most of the time they're not. <laughs> they have relationships, they have, they have credit lines with each other. And so even though I've, I say, hey, Naveen, I'd like to send you a million dollars, they may, you know, withdraw, and they may, uh, you know, kind of credit my account and, and add it to Naveen's at, at two different banks, but the money may actually, may not actually move. Um, and, and that's where these audits, you know, come in and, and they're done quarterly, they're done monthly, they're, you know, what, but they're, they're not settled immediately. So even though Naveen has his money, he's withdrawn, he's gone, done whatever it is, 
really nothing happened. And, and there's a lot of risk there. And it, it has to do with kind of the, the cost of those transactions and how um, heavy these, these, these big institutions are. Yeah. So, Jay, absolutely. So you have hit the nail on the head, right? So a lot of people ask why international cross-border remittances are so expensive, right? So fundamentally, they are so expensive is because to make those transactions possible, banks hold money with each other. So, for example, Bank A will say, hey, you know what? Let me keep $10 million of lump sum money lying in the account at Bank B to make these transactions possible, right? Now, there is a cost of capital for that $10 million. We estimate at about 5 to $10 trillion is sitting in these, let's call it working capital for banks or Nostra accounts all around the world. And that cost essentially gets transferred to both businesses and individuals who essentially then use these remittance services, right? The second thing is you have to hedge for the depreciation risk for these, um, uh, for these, this currency. So for example, this money is sitting in Philippines peso, it's sitting in euros, it's sitting in GBP, and the risk is being carried by the bank, and then that risk needs to be hedged. And of course, the cost of that hedge needs to be passed to both businesses and individuals. And the reason this also happens is because most local markets around the world work nine to five. So for example, the US dollar market will work nine to five in their own time zone. GBP will work in their own time zone. The Japanese yen will work in their own time zones. And because these time zones don't overlap, you don't have the ability to do real-time transfers and to be able to settle at that time. But the great thing about crypto market, so keep everything else aside, double spend problem and decentralization. But the biggest thing that is about the crypto market is it trades 24-7, yep. right? So that means at 12 o'clock in the night on a Sunday, using, say, for example, Bitcoin as an intermediary, USDC as an intermediary, or XRP as an intermediary, you're able to transfer real value from point A to point B in real time, and you're able to have finality in the settlement, which means you're not dependent on having that Nostro account, working capital pre-parked for the transaction to go through, or you're not worried, hey, I have to draw a credit line, and the bank B is taking risk on bank A for the money to come in the next day. And this finality of payment to be able to do it instantly or instant settlement is quite key. So if you actually ask me about cryptocurrency, what's the big deal? Yes, there is a ledger. Yes, there is decentralization and everything else. But it's actually this 24-7 trading, which is the real deal. Because this 24-7 trading means that Jay and Naveen don't need to take risk on each other. We are able to exchange value. If I have something to sell to you, it could be a tokenized um, so, something that I've tokenized, or it could just be a currency. It could be a representation of currency in the form of stable coin. We are able to exchange with each other at 12 o'clock in the night where both our markets are closed. Japanese yen market is closed and the US dollar market is closed, but still be able to do it. Yeah. And I think where this is really so important is, you know, I, I run a lot of enterprise businesses and, and have done a lot over the years. And, you know, one of the biggest use cases uh, for any, any business around the world is payroll. Um, for every HR de department that's sitting out there, you understand this, that you have to start payroll three day, three business days early before you actually want to pay. Um, if it's international, it's about five to seven, depending on where you're going. And it is extremely complicated process that's designed to manage, you know, KYC, AML, money laundering, all sorts of things that, that can happen on a blockchain with sec in seconds take days and are extremely expensive. You know, think of the, the cost on payroll that, that you, you send just to, just to, like, look, you, the poor employees are, you're paying everything in the world and then you have to pay all these fees and, and, you know, uh, and your money's held for days. And so if you have a large company, um, you know, the, the thought of like international payroll that you could have millions of dollars tied up for four or five days, that that's cash flow that, that doesn't work for everybody. You know, that's a different credit line you have to have. Um, and it really is restrictive on, on smaller startups and smaller companies that are trying to scale and be compliant, but they're they're held back by some really archaic technologies um, that the institutions, you know, they have control and they're not interested in letting go of it. Yeah, and also a lot of our institutions are benefiting from it, right? So let's just take a simple example. Let's assume you're a supplier to Naveen and your payment terms are net 30. But by the time I pay you, you get money in your account only on the 33rd day, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it on a yearly basis, that means you lose 36 days of working capital. But let's assume I was paying you through USDC or I was using Ripple uh, to essentially make the payment with XRP as the bridge. You will get paid instantly. You get your money on the 30th day. That means you need one tenth less working capital for overall your for your overall business. So by almost doing nothing else, right? So because me as a buyer, my account got debited on the day 30th. You got money on the day 33. Somebody else enjoyed the three-day float. And essentially, mm -hmm. removing the three-day float out of the system 
we both can become 10% more productive, right? When that means 10% less working capital is required. You are happy, I'm happy, the balance sheet improves. So I personally think that today, the fox is eating too much share in the middle versus two honest businesses that are trying to deal with each other. I think one-tenth of our working capital to be tied is too big a charge to pay for a payment to throw to move from one point to another. Yeah, and I agree. And, and the, the concept is that, you know, the world has evolved quite, quite in, in the fact that you can go online and see your bank account on, on a, you know, a digital screen or on your phone, or on your app, does, like nothing in the back end has changed. Like they, like the Swift system, and there's amazing people working on Swift and what they are, but it's a very binary system. It's, it's designed um, and, and it has what, what technology you refer to as code debt. Um, they can't, they're, they're just stuck. They, this is what it is, this is what it will always be, and we understand that they're doing everything they can to upgrade it and move it. But there's one core problem, is blockchain has has already long surpassed even the most advantageous part of what the Swift could possibly do, because at the end of the day, it's still only doing you know one thing. It's just moving money. It can't move assets. Um, it can't move. It can't manage identities, KYC or AML. So it's a very you know flat system compared to what we can build on blockchain, which is really limitless um, and and you know transparent also. And also let's let's look at human um, attitude, right? Why do we change? We only change when there is fear or greed or significant fear and greed, right? So the least that I expect is if, if with blockchain, one is able to have a parallel system that creates the fear for the existing system to change, right? Because otherwise one would say, hey, why should I change? Because probably the incentive will be harder because to cannibalize your own business is very, very hard, right? There, there's billions of dollars getting made so either there will be new entrepreneurs who will come in and then say, hey, let's take advantage of blockchain companies like us who would make, essentially create a new system because we have incentive to do so, or there would be fear among the existing providers to say, hey, our lunch will get eaten if we don't modernize. So I think both ways, it essentially helps for us to move the industry forward. That's fabulous. So how is it going when you walk into one of these large financial institutions and, and you guys are invited, they, they want, constantly want to speak to you because um, they're trying to understand. And I, I, I don't think that banks are really held back from anything other than they just don't get it. Um, you know, they've, they've been given a very poor education in some cases. Uh, they've, they've hired some bad consultants and others. Um, and others have just said, you know, we, we don't, this is our business model. We don't want to touch it. We'll see where it is in a few years. How how are some of these financial institutions, you know, really thinking or or looking at at blockchain based payments? Yeah, absolutely. So let's look at our customer base into two parts. So one is bank, and the second is remittance companies, right? So remittance companies will be more traditional companies like MoneyGram, but more modern companies like Azimo, I mean, and, and many many others. And you would you would hear uh, so from lots of them essentially trying to get your remittance business, and they're mostly focus just on doing remittance payments very, very well. They have got great UI, UX. And majority of our customers today who are using blockchain at the back end in terms of doing the settlement as well through our solution called as on-demand liquidity. And let me just explain to you in a very simple term what it means are these PSPs or payments companies, right? Um, and traditionally, banks, of course, as you know, will take longer time to essentially come on this journey. And one of the fundamental reasons is because banks have free depositors' money. Right, so their yeah. cost of capital is almost zero. Jay keeps money with bank, and sort of, there is really no cost to that money. Whereas for a for a PSP or for a remittance company, keeping that Nostra account is essentially means that they will not be able to grow. Right. Yeah. So very simply put, what we are essentially doing is so let's assume you are in UK, you are trying to send money into Philippines. Uh, GBP to XRP pair is trading twenty four seven, three sixty five days a year. Right. So it's it's available. You can buy it at Coinbase, Bitum. Uh, sorry, um, uh, and, and mul multiple other exchanges around the world, right? Similarly, XRP to Philippines peso is trading 24-7, 365 days a year, and you can buy it through Coins, PH, PDEX, a lot of government-approved exchanges in the Philippines. So what we are doing is we are taking these two open order books, GBP to XRP, XRP to Philippines peso, and bringing it together, and essentially moving money for Jay for the 1,000 pounds he wants to transfer to Philippines in real time, at a real exchange rate and essentially through a 24 seven payment system, depositing in the bank account in Philippines the way he wanted to, right? So which essentially means you don't need to have any working capital at all. 12 o'clock in the night on Sunday with real live exchange rates, you're able to take advantage of these two open order books and then be able to make the transfer from GBP to Philippines peso with using XRP as a bridge, right? 
And this is quite revolutionary. I mean, nobody else does it. It's significantly a step change cheaper than whatever you are experiencing today in terms of in, in terms of your experience with the bank. And what we are doing is we are doing it at scale for remittance companies. And the reason we are working only on the institutional side is because the institution, and in this case, this payment company is still doing the same KYC on you, making mm-hmm. sure all the AML and the fraud checks are in place and they're complying by the letter and spirit of, of, of the regulation in, in that particular country, right? But what we have done is we have changed the back end. So now their cost of money is zero in terms of uh, uh, holding that working capital that they would have had to help hold in the beneficiary country. We have essentially made sure they have real live rates 24 seven, 365 days a year. So we have essentially re-architected their plumbing and that is the business that's growing gangbusters. So it's called on-demand liquidity where 24 seven, 365 days a year, they have access to real settlement engine provided by Ripple. And and, and just again as a clarifying clarifying yeah. point, this is you're you're complying with KYC and AML. You're 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 following as many of the the laws around the world as as you possibly can. This is just a new technology that doesn't always fit. You know, in in you know, it's a square peg in a round hole. And and you know, but again, there's there's nothing that you're trying to avoid here. It's you come from a from this industry and asset class. You understand, and your team understands. You know what it takes to do this. There's just a lack of education that most people don't have. That's right. And 100% of our customers, uh, whom we work with, are fully licensed and have a license from the central bank or the different regulatory authority in that particular country. So they are in full compliance with with the letter and the spirit of the law. And and exactly. And a lot of them have been there for the last 30, 40, 50 years. So they have, it's it's not that they have just woken up today and started this business. But what we have re-architected is we have re-architected their back end. So they don't have to put millions of dollars in the beneficiary country. They don't have to work on 95 systems. And essentially we have brought them into the new world by mm. using XRP as a bridge versus traditional systems. And and for people that kind of want to understand a little bit of this from the layman's standpoint, and you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, uh, Naven, because I'm, you know, sometimes happens. Um, you know, I was just in Mexico, took my wife for Valentine's Day down to Cancun, and we had a great time. Um, but if you want to purchase anything uh, in, in Mexico, like they are required, they cannot accept, uh, you know, US, like US dollars from a credit card payment, you have to use uh, pesos. That's, that's the same as the United States. They're not going to accept any other money. And what happens is you end up getting hit with, you know, uh, the worst I saw was 20% conversion rate, because if you're at the restaurant or you're at the store and you say, Hey, I, I just want to make, you know, I, I have us dollars. I'd like to make that conversion to pesos, you know, that they, they will do it, but they're going to charge you for it. And what, what you're saying is that the thought that it can, that transaction can happen in real time behind the scenes for fractions of a cent compared to losing 10 to 20%. And again, each way, um, that, that you're losing this. So it's extremely expensive. And most people don't realize that you thought that you were buying, you know, a, a $10 cheeseburger um, and it really cost 12 or 13 because once you get deal with all those fees. And so this is where these remittance companies can integrate with the credit card companies and everyone else and have frictionless. I don't have to, ha- they don't have to hold, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of pesos. Um, just use it as you need it, but it's, it's on demand and it's 24 seven that they never have to say it's not going to be there. Yeah, a hundred percent. Right. And that's the reason what I personally think is that we are actually holding back globalization below 10,000 US dollars because below 10,000 US dollars, you, you really can't have globalization possible. So though, uh, I mean, goods in Mexico can easily travel through NAFTA agreement to the US, but if you're not buying in bulk, if you're not have your order is not above 10,000 US dollars, it's suboptimal because of the friction in the payment system that is essentially there, right? And in my view, we can change that. Let's take another example, right? And this is truly, I mean, every single, if you speak to Wall Street Journal, Economist, FT, they will tell you, hey, today what FT and Wall Street Journal want to do is they want to give Jay the right to just buy access to one article. So yes, you may say, hey, you know what, online, I don't want to pay a subscription for whatever reason. You, you, you're, a, you're a customer who doesn't want to pay 40 US dollar, but you don't, do want to read that one article on Bitcoin that you love, that your friends have talked about, and you're ready to pay 10 cents for it. The yeah. only problem these newspapers have to access these millions of customers who just want to read one article is how do we collect that 10 cents from you, right? Mm-hmm. Because it'll cost them $1 to actually collect that 10 cents. And in some way, for example, public uh, chains like XRP solves that because almost at zero cost, you could essentially pay, do that micropayment of 10 cents uh, in XRP. They could receive it instantly in real time. They could convert that into US dollar at a transaction level or at bulk, and they're happy. And then you're able to read the article. And suddenly they're able to access 
millions of customers worldwide who just want to make this micro payment at a one dollar, two dollar, five dollar. Because the normal payment system is super inefficient. Because if the payment is below maybe even one thousand dollars, it's suboptimal to essentially make that happen. Well, and, and there's you know that's why you go into some smaller stores and there's a minimum that you can do on the credit card. Um, it's it's even as efficient as Visa is, and Visa works nothing every day but reducing the cost of of their transactions, increasing the speed of the transactions, the reliability of the transactions. But it's still not blockchain and it still has a higher cost of of managing and mitigating that risk because it's an internal system that that third parties have to come in and audit they have to look at these things there's you know there's there's it's it's an imperfect system because you're walking around with some random piece of plastic um that that really has no other unique identifiers you know some people have you know apple i think has done a good job of trying to bridge that gap um but you know they're they're probably at this point maybe like one percent of the market of credit cards out there so there, there's absolutely room for for innovators like like ripple to come in and, and do this um what's been some of the 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 more you know larger use cases kind of globally that you've seen have just clicked and and taken off yeah um, so from our point of view the i mean remittance is a big use case right so there is about 150 trillion dollars of cross-border payments that happen of course a lot of the payments happen in the in the large category but lots of payments happen in the small category people all over the world uh, living in different places, but sending money to their families, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing is e-commerce businesses. So if you look at large companies like Amazon, today you can go on Amazon Korea, buy your favorite brand of kimchi made by a, 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 a farmer or, or in a small town in Korea. But today, of course, the payment systems have not caught up. So what we are seeing is quite a bit of take up in the e-commerce space as well. Payroll you essentially touched on. Now, as the freelancer economy takes off, where a lot of time payments are being made uh, to people around the world and gig economies there where you could just get a presentation essentially done by somebody else and they charge you $100, then uh, crypto is the best way for you to be able to pay them or use crypto as a bridge for you to be able to pay them. Uh, in the corporate space, what we are essentially seeing is, and this is still needs to evolve a little bit is, say for example, J Inc, has got two accounts, right? So you have essentially a US dollar account and you also have a GBP account. So you are a two country or a three country, let's say you have a Euro account as well, right? So what you essentially want to do is you want to optimize your cash between these three accounts. Lots of times you'll have an extra hundred US dollars, but you need hundred euros. I'm just using one-to-one -one as an exchange. And, and you just need it for two days because third day uh, your buyer will pay into your Euro account. So you really don't need long-term lending. You just need short-term cash no. in that particular uh, situation, right? So what we are seeing is that there is a large um, emerging use case around optimizing value in which there could either be a movement of actual money or they could essentially just be collateralization, which essentially, I mean, institutions like at some point, Aave and everybody else will evolve into where they could have a stable coin from you, which is uh, US dollar representation, it could be USDC or it could be somebody else. You hold it and then you can take a stable coin on the other side, on the Euro side. Use that for your need for two days and after that reverse that trend, right? So which essentially means you don't have to transfer physical cash, but you're yeah. able to take advantage of uh, institutional sort of a DeFi platform. Of course, this will take some time for it to emerge, but basically constantly balancing your working capital, which could be in multiple currencies. So in my view, this is a more emerging use case, but the earlier use case is about payroll, about remittances, about money moving cross border for e-commerce is something which is already at, happening at scale. Yeah, and, and and I've heard uh, a use case similar to this, which is the the very large uh, traders um, that are that are trading not just on the Nasdaq, Dow, and S and P, but you know in, in J Japan and other foreign markets as well. That you know there were when you're across the world, and you know a lot of traders. I know everyone likes to think that hey, the the bell rings, they they start working, the bell rings again, and they go to sleep. Um, that's not always the case. You know, they they there's after hours trading and everything else, and the concept that if someone's got a hundred million dollars. In, in U.S. markets, and they've got you know ten million dollars in, in the Japanese market. That that that's where they're kind of stuck. And if there's an opportunity in in Japan that they want to take advantage of, like they're just going to miss it, or they got to take a loan which costs them more money and, and it adds to the risk metrics. They can't just take you know I want to move ten million dollars from the U.S. and in in five minutes they're they're making their their bet in Japan. Um, it can't happen today. But but this is what blockchain can enable is is really dynamic ability to to manage global markets in a way that we've never seen before yes absolutely and everybody wins right so mm -hmm. you're reducing the cost of capital because you require risk capital less capital we are reducing the total amount of risk 
that is being taken by that particular institution. And the last thing that we're doing is we are helping them to get better return on that scarce capital. So instead of deploying 300 million, now they're able to make that 100 million work in the US time zone, the UK time zone, and then later on in the Japanese time zone, right? So almost 24 seven coverage, right? So everybody would sh should win and which would mean the institutions will have the ability to bring more and more product services to people, right? So to me, I mean, one of the reason, I mean, we talk about financial inclusion, but one of the reason financial inclusion is not happening at scale is because it's still too expensive to do things. So if you reduce that cost by one third or you Im improve the ability for people to profit by moving the capital from point A to point B instantly, then automatically some of these things become possible. That, I love that. So I, I am not a regulatory expert. Um, and and uh, I will assume that you are or know lots of people that are. Um, but one of the things that I've said is that I think that 1031 like kind exchange should be absolutely valid for, for cryptocurrencies. Um, if you want to go from, you know, uh, Ethereum to wrapped Ethereum or Bitcoin to wrapped Bitcoin, that's not a taxable, you know, to me, I, I think that that's silly that that's a taxable change. And it really does kind of slow and hurt the market down. Um, but you, I'm sure you have some, you know, very, uh, valid, you know, rules that are on the books today that would absolutely bring the innovation that we're talking about um, into a compliant and regulatory, you know, framework um, in, into the market today and, and provide immense value for people around the world. What, what would be some of your thoughts? I think so. I mean, there is a huge amount of literature and 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 a lot of things written. But let's focus on the solution. How can we solve for this, right? Mm -hmm. And and this is something that I learned when I was building Uber for trucks. This is something that we use at Triple as well, right? So if you look at the whole world and then say, hey, let me solve this regulation problem, it just seems to be overwhelming. Right? Like you say, hey, you know what? This is crazy. How can we get all the 150 nations together, or or the G, even the G7 or the G10 nations together with varying interest and get their attention to essentially solve this problem. Because yeah. this needs not to be solved in one country, but it needs to be solved in multiple countries at the same time. So we have some kind of a, let's call it a level playing field, uh, particularly because money will move cross border because blockchain just blockchains tend to be global in nature in terms of the movement of money, right? So mm -hmm. I think the easiest way to solve it, and this is how we looked at Ripple to say, hey, let's solve it for one corridor. Let's assume from US to Mexico only, or from NAFTA, Canada, US and Mexico. And then let's solve it for one segment to essentially say, hey, companies that are manufacturing in Mexico and supplying to US and Canada, or companies that are manufacturing in Canada, supplying to the US. Can we get together and just for that field agree what are the rules that will essentially apply, right? To essentially say, hey, you know what? There will be a stable coin and that stable coin will be acceptable in that region among these three countries because almost 100% of the invoicing happens in US dollars, both between buyers and suppliers. So exactly the point that you essentially make made, why can't we have capital flow through, through, uh, freely in terms of a tokenized stable coin? Let's just take as an example between these three countries, between let's say these industrial areas, or we could pick another two, friendly countries, say, for example, Singapore and Thailand, or say, Japan and, and another, another country, say, Thailand, that they work closely with. And then say, hey, between these two governments, can we sit together along with the industry and then say, hey, this is the huge benefit that we'll be able to bring uh, to you. Can we put enabling laws and provisions in place? This is, that essentially solves for that. Now, there is a vested interest for the government to say, I want to reduce friction between these two countries, because we have already agreed through a regional trade agreement or for political reason that we are going to be close for that. Now, the moment you solve that and then prove that at scale it works and the institutions and the individuals start to take benefit from it, you start to see adoption. Then suddenly mm -hmm. you will see third country join in four, fifth, six, because otherwise they will view this as unfair competitive advantage and the businesses in that third country will push hard to say, if Jay and Naveen are able to do this together, why can't I be included? Why can't I take advantage of a similar system? And you suddenly start to have a world where there are a lot of these sort of bespoke lines, A yep. to B, P to E, L to S, P to S, start to develop. But then you start to see these lighted up in the world where you suddenly say, hey, you know what? World looks much better. And then we do triangulation. We essentially bring them together in a common platform. But to me, otherwise, it just looks too overwhelming to say, how do I solve this problem? I want to solve this problem where initially in a zone or in between two countries or between two areas where there's already a, a existing commercial interest or an existing political interest that can make it happen.
You know, and, and I want to, you know, say that, you know, we're talking about Web3, which is, you know, blockchain, NFTs, smart contracts, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, AI, like all these, these new technologies that, are, that have been around for a while, but they're now becoming main, you know, ready for mainstream. And when we think about Web1, I, I think about the, the, the leeway that, you know, e-commerce was given for well over a decade, meaning that, you know, I, I owned a, a relatively large, uh, you know, brick and mortar re retailer. And I was competing with people that didn't have to collect sales tax, um, you know, in, in my market. And so clients of, of ours would walk in and, and they can get a, a seven to 10% discount just because they don't have to pay the sales tax. And the US government was like, hey, they need some time to grow. They need some time to figure the things out. And, and they eventually figured that out and settled it up. Um, but it was a like, there was just utter leeway. They had no, like, absolutely, we know what they're doing, but but they need some time because it's an emerging technology. Why aren't, why, why are they taking such a hard approach to the exact same concept today um, of like, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to follow the rules. Yeah. I personally think people are generally scared, right? So, um, and, and also there is a lack of education in the area, right? So if you look at even now or a couple of years, the, all the news about Bitcoin will always be about speculation, right? So for example, I mean, I'm just using um, uh, Bitcoin as a representation of cryptocurrency, right? It'll be about hijacking. It is about, hey, you know what, how it's being used for ransom and things like this, right? So I also feel there is a huge amount of, uh, let's say, moral, um, pressure on shoulders of companies like Ripple to say, can we make sure that we build businesses at scale, which are fully compliant, which essentially work well, deliver the right value in terms of the real use case, and then also be able to bring regulators around to say, hey, here's one use case, it's fully compliant, at the same time deliver exceptional value to your businesses as an individual, can you give same sort of room for other use cases as well? And it could be institutional DeFi, it could be other platform that people are building. But I think this needs to be some way proven to say, hey, you know what, what is the real use case that the regulators can look up to and then say, hey, you know what, this works and hence uh, a get out of jail card needs to be given. Um, you know, we can, we can, Bernie Madoff, you know, you, you name it, Enron, like it, it happens all the time. So, you know, where we're, I'm really, you know, heavily focused right now is trying to understand, you know, what is the roadmap? You know where where are we where are we trying to get get to, um, and what are the first steps of of that education to me? Um, you know most most senators, congressmen here in the United States, they have no concept, and I hear them making statements and even issuing statements, which are absolutely incorrect. Um, not have no sound basis. They're 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 throwing things at the wall, and it, it makes good media. How, how how do we get to the most influential people in inside this these these uh, regulatory um, classes? And how do we educate them to understand that this is, we're just trying to settle payments. Like we're, it's nothing different. We're just settling payments here. We didn't make anything new. So for us, what has really worked is, so, so just to give you an example. So whenever we approach a regulator, right? We approach them along with an existing license holder holding institution, right? So somebody whom they know for the last 50 years and essentially know that their track record is great. These are the people whom we can trust. They've always done the right thing. And then essentially bring this new case by using, for example, uh, XRP or crypto as a bridge to essentially make the same thing happen what they've been doing for the last 50 years. And when they look at it, it just the lights go on and they essentially say, hey, this is obvious. This makes sense. And of course, initially, there may be some guardrails in terms of do some uh, more frequent reporting into us. Just we want to make sure it's working as intended. But after that, they have essentially just said, yeah, this makes sense. Go ahead and do it. So and then we have been able to build it at scale. And I think that is to me important as well, because today I'll be very upfront, right? So I think a lot of time blockchain as industry has been very tribal, right? Like where it doesn't speak to the mainstream. So for example, I, I just assume that if somebody was to go along with Amazon to a group of senators or a group of um, uh, approvers, and I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the US regulators, but a lot of, in a lot of other places, wherever home base for that particular institution is, we will get a lot of reception because they actually already trust that institution, which has been doing a job for, with them. And they know then that means that the use can, case can essentially gain scale, right? And then of course, uh, that could be the starting point and then go from there. So to me, right now, everybody is sort of sitting in their opposite camps. Uh, the blockchain industry want to, of course, convince the regulators, the regulator wants more awareness, but nobody is really showing their cards 
to say, okay, is there a bridge in the middle? And I also truly believe that eventually blockchain will move mainstream with Web2 adoption, which means there will be large companies who will essentially say, hey, you know what? This technology is real. It's helpful for us. We have these millions of customers who need to get exposed and essentially benefit from it, right? Of course, there will be newer companies as well, but also mainstream adoption will happen from existing companies essentially uh, adopting to the blockchain technology. And that's where it helps as well, because they already have the customers, they already have the trust of the institutions. And through this new technology, we are able to bring them back. I, and I think that's absolutely the, the correct way to do it is to bring the institutions um, to the technology and not try to take the clients away from the institutions. Because the one thing I can say clearly is that self custody does not work. Um, and I can say that because I've seen some of the smartest people on the planet that have been in the space for over a decade, and they're still losing their stuff out of their wallets. And and you know we we hear about it every single day. There's there's you know billions of dollars lost in bridges, um, billions of dollars lost to you know you go click on one wrong email um, and. In your crypto wallet strain. It's a whole different deal if like, hey, I lost my photos or I lost my, um, you know, my, my computer has to be, you know, re, re imaged or whatever the case is. It's a whole different deal. You click one button and you lose all your assets. Um, and so I, I think that we still have a ways to go on the security side of things. But but clearly the use case has been proven. Now it's just a matter of getting it to that that point of that we're ready for mainstream adoption. 100%. And I think one, one thing I would say, like you rightly said, I think we as an industry have done a terrible job on the UI UX, right? Just making it super Hold. easy for people to come on board. Right? I think that's something that needs to be fixed in, in, a, in a very, very significant way. I also will say, Jay, really, to be honest, I think this is also a problem of sometimes getting money too early, right? So a lot of projects, because of they have been able to monetize the tokens, have not essentially really worked hard to earn the customers, right? So because the availability of the money has been there and 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 they've been able to use uh, the token or the digital assets as a mean to essentially recruit early users or early customers they have not done the hard yards right so i think now it's the time and to me in some way forest fire like this is great because it forces everybody to say hey what's my competitive advantage what's my unique business model why should j be my customer and be my customer and not because he's able to get some airdrop or anything as, as, as well, right? So I think it forces everybody. And if there isn't one, then it forces people to give up and, and essentially get out, right? So uh, to me, I mean, I think, I think that's great. And there's more work that needs to be done in that direction. Fully agree, fully agree. Uh, Navin, this has been just such an amazing conversation because Ripple and, you know, again, let's, let's ignore all the, the headlines and the mainstream media, which really don't understand what we do on a daily basis. And, you know, the technology, technological and regulatory hurdles that you guys are every single day attempting um, and succeeding in, in really managing and, and mitigating and, and, and navigating in so many ways um, is, is just amazing. Um, you're, you're much like myself. You're, you're very vocal uh, about Web3. You attend many conferences and, and you do so much educating uh, young entrepreneurs that are interested in the space, um, which is one of our core theses at YWales as well. Uh, but the challenge I run into, and, and we've seen this quite a bit, um, is, is some of the most brilliant people that I've ever encountered in my life that are building projects that have absolutely no client base that that will ever exist. Um, they, they're building technology that was, you know, extremely exciting two years ago, um, or quite simply, they're, they're just start to build and they don't even know what they're building or where it's going. They just believe if you sprinkle a little blockchain pixie dust on it, you know, the money will come in and so will the clients. How, how, how would you um, think of, of at least, you know, advising or, or thinking about, you know, entering the blockchain space and, and building a project or, or expanding on a project? Yeah. Um, so Jay, first of all, thank you very much for asking this question. This, this does make a lot of sense, right? I think to me, sometimes or a lot of time, I would say what people are saying is I have a solution now, let me find a problem where it essentially fits in. And I think that's just the absolute wrong way to do it. And we don't do it in normal life. And in some way, if you look at the traditional industries, the VC or availability of capital essentially forces you to, to kind of give up very early on to say, hey, you know what, I'm building something which has no use for, right? In the blockchain space, in some way, the availability or ability to be able to issue tokens have essentially hindered that, that clearance to happen, right? So the first thing, some, someone as a founder or somebody who's looking at a company to essentially make sure that truly there is a problem that they're solving for and there is a customer base 
that is ready to pay for the solution to that problem, right? And then they have a path in terms of go-to-market to be able to reach out to those customers for that solution to be available. And I think once it's clear in their mind, then it, it becomes easier. The second thing that I've found is that lots of times the project or that idea is being run at a very technical level, right? So people are brilliant at the technology side, but there is no commercial domain experience. There is no expertise in that industry, maybe real estate or XYZ problem that they're trying to solve. And in absence of that, they run afoul to regulation or they may run afoul to just, let's say, um, inherent laws that operate in that industry, right? And unless you marry both the tech and the commercial acumen together, the project doesn't become successful. So as you look at uh, in, in, the, in the normal VC space, lots of time they'll say, hey, do you have a tech co-founder? I mean, you, somebody may have domain expertise, but they have to bring their tech co-founder. And the marriage of the two, and we have seen that happening in multiple places, is essentially what makes that particular company successful. And I think more and more of that needs to happen in the blockchain world, where there has to be a real problem. There has to be both commercial domain experience and also expertise around blockchain. And then the marriage of both essentially then goes and make, makes that happen. There is no substitute for the 10,000 hours of experience. And, you know, there's, there's, there's luck. Some people can get lucky and get around it. Uh, but at the end of the day, in a, in an asset class that is going to be highly regulated, that is going to be highly volatile. Um, there, there still is no, you know, substitution for that 10,000 hours, um, in adjacent, uh, asset classes that, that integrate you know, with uh, what what we do today. So, um, you know, Navin, I, I can't thank you enough for for your time. I, this is this has been amazing. We know that you and Ripple are are tackling some of the largest problems globally uh, with the financial markets, and and really applaud you for everything you're doing. Uh, understand how hard it is. Understand how much mis uh, education that that has occurred of people that have been taught the wrong thing, and they believe um, things that were maybe said years ago that have long since disappeared, been rectified, or or just never existed in, in the first part. Um, that being said, as we kind of bring it to a, to a close, if there are financial institutions that are interested um, in, in partnering with Ripple or, or understanding, uh, you know, supporting supporting your protocols, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you guys? Yeah, I think just get hold of us on a website. Just, I mean, DM me on the LinkedIn. We'll be, we'll be more than happy to speak. Uh, we are a very open company, very open for entrepreneurs, uh, not only in terms of our own product set, but we also back entrepreneurs in terms of companies that we are backing. We also back in terms of development on XRP Ledger. So either you need technical support or you need grants. Uh, so there are multiple avenues. Of course, if you're an NFT artist or an NFT company, we have a large grants program where we are able to work with you uh, to make sure that your project is successful. So there are multiple avenues, but just make sure that whatever you are doing, there is a, let's call it good compatibility between uh, what we are supporting. And a lot of this information is publicly available. And then again, happy to help and making sure uh, that indeed we are able to put our shoulder behind whatever you are doing. And you guys are almost every single, uh, you know, Web3 or blockchain convention that I've, I've been to. The Ripples is always there and uh, doing a great job and educating the 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 newbies that are walking in as well as really helping to integrate into some of the more mature projects. So I, I thank you for everything you do in the industry and in our asset class. Um, Why Whales, this is uh, Navin Gupta with Ripple and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much and happy Valentine's Day one more time to everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you guys. Talk soon. Yes. <laughs>